So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I trust uh, we all had a nice lunch and not too sleepy, I hope. I'll try and keep you entertained a little bit. If, if I see somebody nodding off, I'll go and poke them in the head a little bit. You know? Actually, I used to have a history professor who was really great with chalk. And it's would see the bam! <laughs> he was accurate. He should have been a pitcher. But. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about security without the high cost. You all have seen one-time passwords and uh, RSA tokens, VASCO tokens, and many users are still paying exorbitant amounts of money for that. And I'm going to show you ways that should not have to be that way. This technology has been around for 25 years, and I consider it a commodity. Okay, so one of the things I have a couple roles. I, I work with this company, LS Experts, but I'm also uh, involved in Oath, which is the initiative uh, open authentication, which you'll see about that in a minute. So, pardon me, but I have to manually do my slides because I didn't bring a um, remote control. So, why do we need? Strong authentication. I think we heard some things between yesterday and today about the need for security with the fraud that continues to go along. If you look at 10 million Americans just last year alone, over three and a half billion dollars worth of online fraud. Um, websites stealing passwords is is more than a hobby, right? It is. It's a profession. So, you know, this is a it's a growing threat. The cybercrime, and you see where, if that was gonna grow, yeah. So what do these all companies have in common? I started using a slide like this about six, seven years ago and I had four companies on it. But it's really interesting because the things they all have in common is as you know, they were all hacked, right? Well, Target in the year 2000 introduced what's known as today a chip card as we're now starting to get with our credit cards, right? A chip on the credit card. They introduced this as a Target Visa card 15 years ago. They were leaders. They were at the forefront. Unfortunately, their CTO told the CEO that it was slowing down their transactions and they killed the program in 2004. That's the same CEO that was fired when they had their big breach. Had they continued using that chip card, they would not have had that big breach. And that's why we're starting to see the chip cards finally being rolled out in the United States. So, you know, this is just a smattering as to what's been going on in the world, right? As you see some of the, you know, this is just a graph showing the size of the hacks, right? Uh, one of the things that I saw early on, a number of years ago, RSA was, was hacked, right? The leaders of the tokens. Every 230 million of their tokens were compromised because some engineer responded to some phishing site, got a hold of his computer, and the rest is history. But the sad part about that, this is the leading security company in the world, and they kept the seed files on the same server that they had the email on. Now, how stupid is that? After their massive hack, where they have a lot of people downloading videos from their servers, if they're smart, they would have two separate networks, right, that are not connected. One with their personal, their company stuff, and then one for the customer-facing stuff. And that's what we're starting to get to, where you have to actually cut cord and keep them independent from one another because as we've seen with the cars, if it's all on the same network, it's gonna get hacked one way or the other. So it's something to, to recall. So just looking a little bit about the market size. And this is good news for everybody in the security business because we're all guaranteed to have a job. And if you're not involved in security, and that's why you're here, get involved in it because you will have a job for as long as you want. So the market is growing dramatically, right? The IT spending is, is going to go $170 billion. That's no small potatoes, right? It's going to double the rate of the IT budgets. Even though some companies are shrinking their IT budgets overall, the security side of it is, is growing up. And some companies that never had security 
are now starting to have, realizing that they need to have it. I look at companies such as credit unions, uh, police departments, small little organizations of 50, 100 people. They all need to have some IT security. They can't just sit there and have a password protecting their network. It's, you know, not really cool. So the only growth slowing is the fact that we're seeing massive consolidation. So I've been involved in this organization, as I mentioned, called Oath. And in the last 10 years, I've watched probably 35 companies get acquired that were all part of Oath. Uh, Symantec made a couple, HID made a couple, Microsoft's made a couple, Computer Associates, Intel's made three, Jamalto's made four, and the list goes on and on and on. All the little guys are getting bought by the bigger guys because they want to be able to provide one-stop shopping to their customers. They want to be able to walk into a... Uh, uh, Alcoa or uh, Pepsi and say, I can do whatever you need. You want to buy apples? I have apples. You want oranges? I have oranges. I have the whole gamut. I can provide your email security, your web security, your single sign-on. I can do it all. And that's good and bad because when a market matures, that means the big players get involved. Four years ago, well, five years ago now, Intel did not have a security group, believe it or not. Now they have a security group that has thousands of people involved in it. Microsoft didn't have a very small security group until they bought Phone Factor four years ago. And now they have a big security team. And so if you're with a company that doesn't have a security team, maybe you can lead the way. So where have we been? Probably most of the people in this room weren't even alive then, but the first computer-generated password, 1961. And I think, well, we'll see the, a number a little bit later on. But some statistics. Just last year alone, there were 780 breaches in all categories, all different parts, right? Finance, government, business, does not matter. Healthcare, 169 million records. Now, if there are no duplicates, which I'm sure there were duplicates, but if there were no duplicates, that's half the population of the United States. That's huge, if you think about it. That means half the people in this room have been compromised, whether they know it or not. If you go back 10 years, over 850, almost 850 million records. This is big business. The credit card companies, the United States, is about 27% of the credit card volume. Today, we're about 50% of the fraud. Now, I've talked to Visa, MasterCard, and American Express many years, many years ago about putting a chip on the card. Those of us that have ever been to Europe have seen what the Europeans have done. They've had the chip on the card since the 90s, right? It was started by the French in like 91, 92 as a way to get rid of the phone theft that was happening on the public pay phones. It was a phone card. That's how the chip card business got started. And today, still, the largest card manufacturers are French companies. That's why French are very strong in security. One of the reasons why is because they've been involved in this for so long. But when I talk to Visa, yes? So I, have, I have two questions about cards. I'm not from the US, so. <laughs> uh, first of all, why uh, the chip transactions in the US work much slower than that's one thing I noticed. And the second thing is, like in Europe, most of the cards right now have the PayWave yes. uh, functionality, right? The uh, your payments. NFC. I, mm -hmm. I haven't seen that in the US. So okay. Right. The first question about the slowness of a chip yeah. transaction, because the initial setup in the US was for the MagStripe. Right. And everything goes, when you swipe your MagStripe, that goes to Omaha, goes to the processor, goes to your issuer bank, it checks out your balance is good, checks out that it's not a fraudulent card and comes back to you and it does that in about a second and a half. That is very mature and it's very quick. The chip side of it is a different story. When you insert the chip, as we're starting to have, if anybody's used your chip so far, and it does take longer, because that has to stay for the entire transaction. When you insert the chip, it runs the whole, until that, that uh, checkout person hits the final enter key, 
then it processes it. So the chip has to stay in there. That's the only, that's yeah, the reason. But in Europe, when I use like chip cards, it's just like because a lot of times I think in Europe they're still batching it. They may not be 100% uh, online because that historically has been the U.S. has been online and Europe has been a, in a batch where they send them periodically. They don't send them immediately. Okay. Yes. They batch at the end of the day, yeah. And the, and the pay wave technology? Okay, the pay wave technology is, is NFC, for you, those of you that know or do not know, and it's contactless. So the chip today is a contact chip that we're coming out with. The contactless chip, many of the capabilities are there, but it has not been implemented because, well, that's what Apple is using, right? They, and, and Samsung Pay, Apple Pay, uh, Google Pay, they're all using the NFC technology. It's happening, but it's, it's a slower transition because it takes education. You have to educate. I've tried to use mine at, at a terminal, and the lady told me, she says, swipe your card. I said, no, I already tapped. No, you didn't swipe your card. I says, I tapped it, but you didn't swipe it. I said, I don't have to swipe it. She did not understand. You know, so there's, a, there's that whole education process. You know, I tried to tuk, 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 give her a you know, slap in the face to make her understand. Didn't, didn't, it didn't work. <laughs> so what happened with the fraud when I talked to Visa and MasterCard and stuff years ago, and they said, well, the cost of fraud is down here. The cost of implementation is here. And now that has shifted. About two years ago, you know, it used to be when you traveled to Europe, you're supposed to come home and cut up your card because it was, it was going to get hacked if you went to Europe. Well, today, the cards are getting hacked in the United States. Has everybody here had one, of the, one or more of their cards hacked? I've had all my credit cards hacked in the last two years. You know, and I had to get a new one because somebody made some weird internet charges on it. And, and so the fraud is all coming here. The United States is now the weakest link as the rest of the world has been implementing the chip card. So now what's going to happen, which is what's interesting, is, well, you know, things like this. So when we get online, this is where the chip does not really affect you because it doesn't protect you when you're online because you don't have a card reader. You're not inserting your card into a terminal as you would at a point of sale. So as our online transactions are growing, so is the fraud growing. In every country that implemented EMV, which is the chip card, the online fraud has, has gone up. And so this is where the fraudsters are going now. It's like a balloon. You squeeze one end and it goes up the other side. They're not going to go away. The fraudsters aren't, aren't going to go get a legitimate job. They're just going to find another way to get our money. And so now we need to protect the online because that's where all of our business is going, right? I've, I spent probably two-thirds of my transactions are online these days. I, don't, I, I hardly ever go into a shopping mall. It's, I don't find them very fun. So the hackers are everywhere. It's big business, right? They're uh, nation states supported by, by nefarious governments. They're uh, like mafia. They're, they're organized crime. Uh, there, there are rings, uh, you know, that operate in, in cities where they steal people's credit card numbers and then they, you know, you can go buy you know, a bulk of, of 10,000 credit card numbers, like 10 cents a number, you know, you can go find those things online real easily. You know, it, it's, they're everywhere. So we need to protect against that. So as I talked a little bit about, you know, last year with some of the breaches, you know, we look at the numbers. The numbers are staggering. But one of the things that's interesting here, if you look at what they got, not only did they get social security numbers, they got physical email addresses. If you look at the, the Office of Personnel Management, which is our government and the government employees, look at the data that they got. They got complete background, social security numbers, and I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but if I were uh, a government, a bad government that does not like the United States and wants to, to take us down and find out everything about us, what better way than to hack into things like this and build a complete picture of the structure of our government, where they're going, what they're doing, who they are, who their family is. 
you can put together a number of these breaches. They're not just to steal money. It's information. And they're going to take that information, and they can build a complete portrait of how we operate and how we work. I'm not saying that's happening, but it could. And I, we could write a, a, a story about that, right? So as I said, the trends, the EMC, yeah, EMV chip and pin is coming in the United States, but it's not a complete implementation. Those of us that have been to Europe, it's chip and pin. In the United States, it's chip and signature. Signature's not as secure as the pin. They implemented the chip and signature because it was a faster, easier implementation. The pin will be coming later on, but we may all just move into a pay wave, so it may not happen. So just a little bit, some more trends. So, just, just more comments. So yes. With pay wave, uh, at least in Europe, there's usually a limit, so you still have to use pin uh, if the transaction is over a certain Over 100 euro or something, yes. Exactly. That's the way the, the debit cards have always been, right? They follow that, that model. They, they, they keep it to a limit, yes. So as I said, the fraud's moving online. The mobile payment e-commerce is growing exponentially, which is huge opportunity, right? So why now? Well, the pressure's mounting. Rapid growth of these attacks, right? The information that needs protection is growing. We get more and more of our information, you know, is, is online. Uh, I think I'm more worried about losing my phone than I am my wallet, most cases, right? There's more, there's more to be lost with my phone than my wallet. My wallet has five credit cards and, and a couple of other worthless cards. You know, I can cancel that in a minute. But if I lose my phone, man, I'm in, I'm in deep trouble because that's my whole life is in there, right? So our, our company reputations are at risk. Our leadership reputations are at, at risk. Now, this is what's interesting is the PII regulation. That's your personal identifiable information. If you saw what happened to Angela Merkel and, and her assistant, whatever, the, she put her hand up and a picture was taken of her hand. Her fingerprints were, were copied from that photograph. Now her fingerprints are gone. They're out there. She can't get more fingerprints. <laughs> she only has 10 fingers, right? Once that information is out there, and if a hacker gets a hold of it, they can impersonate you. And that's very difficult to make that revocable. We'll see a little bit more about that later on. That's a concern, right? Uh, anybody has seen Ancestry.com? For those of us that live in Orange County, it was a real life case of why Hopefully nobody works for Ancestry.com. Why you don't know how to use them? Because if you use Ancestry.com, they take your DNA, and it becomes theirs. And they get hacked. Your DNA is gone. There was a man in Orange County who was, uh, he was acquitted, but he was accused of murder. And he went to go to court, and because of his DNA, because he went on to Ancestry.com and his DNA was on Ancestry.com. And they accused him of murder from the, from the DNA at the scene. Turns out it was a distant cousin of his because, as you know, the DNA goes through a, a selection process of down to maybe, you know, it was down into the level of, of maybe, you know, uh, a million people around the world would have this DNA. But he, he almost went to jail for murder he didn't commit because of what he did on Ancestry.com. So... Just a, a word to the wise, just something you might not want to participate in. So having strong security, it is a competitive advantage, right? Those that don't have it are going to get in trouble. So here's a, some number of authentication methods for like one-time password things. We have simple passwords, we have challenges, we have one-time passwords, we have public key, we have the single sign-on, we have adaptive authentication. We're gonna hear a little bit more about that. And biometrics and push technologies and hardware, software tokens, SMS. SMS works great as long as you have a uh, connection, right? If you don't have a connection, you know, it's a little bit challenging sometimes. Bill Gates declared the password dead. That was 12 years ago. So there are a number of issues that face the IT managers. And I think you know, we're dealing with some companies where 
the people don't have a clue of what security is all about. I, I show, you know, my neighbors, you know, what I've been doing, and they just kind of look at me like, oh, is a need for that? Yes, there's a need for it. So we need to learn, right? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Oath is. Oath is the initiative for open authentication. There's a number of companies that was formed to work together to drive adoption for strong authentication that's open across all networks. Okay, It was created nine years ago, and there were hundreds of companies that were involved. Some companies choose to stay a member. Some companies don't because the algorithms are free and open source, and they're available for anybody to download and use. So we took existing standards, and we wrote a reference architecture for strong authentication for users. The purpose behind it was to reduce the cost and complexity of adopting strong authentication. Now, I have to say, it, nine years ago, I don't think we really accomplished what we wanted to do. Was to, we, we were able to get the standards, and we were able to get what we wanted to get people using it, but we didn't reduce the cost. And that's what I would like to hopefully do. I want us to, re I think everybody should be able to use strong authentication without being burdened by high cost. Okay, so here are some of the challenges that, that caused Oath to be started and formed, was the theft of confidential data, the inability to share that data without risk, and then the lack of a viable single sign-on. Okay, so we addressed these challenges with standard technology. We took an all-encompassing approach, okay? Everybody that was involved as a vendor in strong authentication were members at one time. And here's a, a, a partial list of some of the members. Some of the members of companies are recognizable, and, and some of them aren't that, that use it. Like, you won't see computer associates on here. You won't see Google or, or, or Microsoft, but they all use it. For those that attend the RSA conference uh, next month in San Francisco, anybody here going? Oh, OK. So RSA conference was started by RSA, the company, 20 some odd years ago. It's the largest security conference, pretty much, in the United States. And there will be at least 30 companies that will be using the Oath algorithms in their solutions. They won't maybe advertising it, but it's there. Anybody have Google Authenticator on their phones that uses the Oath algorithm? So basically, the Oath reference architecture was to establish a common ground, right? The, the reference architecture is centered and around the side of it with the four guiding principles of the royalty free open specifications, the embedding and innovation of the device in embedding, the risk based validation framework, and the interoperable modules. And then version two came out with risk based authentication and identity sharing. So the the algorithms that were created, one was a HOTP and a TH OTP. So the first one is event-based, and the next one is time-based. And then the third was a uh, was the OCRA, which is kind of opposite. I don't know why that happened, but it's the challenge response algorithm. Yes, question. Does this have any like re does this have any relation or, or to FIDO at all? Ah. It's a good question. I was going to talk a little bit about FIDO. Yes, actually, we uh, have worked a little bit with FIDO. Uh, FIDO is trying to remove the passwords. So they're trying to not have any password at all and using like whatever it is, a biometric or something to, to, to log in. And they're trying to take Oath more like a step further because it's almost, they're, they're using a, um, uh, like a challenge response. And, it, and it's like a half a PKI. It's not a full PKI implementation. So it's like a PK because <laughs> they, they create a public key. That's, that's the really the difference. But, but I'll show you a little bit what we were doing with the diametric symmetric key. And that's similar to what, what FIDO is, is doing. So all these uh, three algorithms that were created have all been uh, turned into standards by the IETF. Oh, there's a typo. And they're free to download. You can use them, you can develop something with them, or you can come to me and, and I can take care of you. 
So the roadmap was to create those algorithms, the credential and the provisioning lifecycle with the public key symmetric uh, container and the dimetric, uh, yeah, the dynamic symmetric key provisioning. And then we created a certification program along with uh, WS validation and uh, the uh, identity sharing network. So if you look at today, there's any form factor you want, right? I worked for the company that created the, the card. That's why there's four of them up there. But we, we created the OTP on a card. It was developed by a French company and was made in, by a Swiss company. Now it's a French company again, but anyway. And then there are soft tokens and the regular standardized tokens. And there are USB keys. There's infl embedded flash. There's all sorts of various ways. And I don't see my arrows. Oh, they don't show up in there. OK. The certification program was started a couple years ago to one of the concerns I had, because people would choose to be a member, adopt the algorithms, and then say, I don't need to be a member anymore. And then they post on their website and their literature, you know, oath enabled, oath certified, and it says, well, 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 how do we know? How do we know you implemented it properly? So we started the certification program so that we could test the interoperability. Because if somebody is selling tokens and someone has an oath server, we want to make sure that that oath server is going to be able to manage those tokens properly, right? That's the whole point of it. So we've had numerous products that have been certified by a number of companies, well over 30 companies, but they certify both sides. If you're just a, uh, a token manufacturer, you'll, you'll certify your tokens. If you do both, you can do both the server and the token. And so we have these validation servers for both the TOTP and the HOTP. And there's the website which has them all listed as to what's available. So just, just a, a quick review as to what we've done, right? We had the certification program. We created the, the uh, OTPs, the uh, algorithm development, and the provisioning protocols, the portable symmetric key container, the validation protocols, and then we started this, this fraud report and, and this token identifier namespace. So anyone that's a manufacturer of, of a token product can get a, a two-digit name for their product so that can go in the front of, of their labeling and, and that we have the registry that keeps track of that. So in, in 2015, we, we completed the uh, update on the profiles of the algorithms. We expanded the certification program and uh, added some enhancements, uh, the valid specification, and using the OTP with, with NFC technology and, and moving into the SAML 2.0 OTP. Is that going to come up? Uh, oh, I think I need to do that. OK. So just a little further about the framework. Yeah. There's, you can see the authentication protocols, the validation framework, the provisioning framework with the user storage and the, and the token storage. And it all goes across the authentication and the sharing methods Okay, for the, for the framework of the way Oath is structured. So here's just a little bit about the Oath and the FIDO. So we had a, a Web Oath client uh, API, did that draft uh, a couple years ago now, and it would allow the vendors to have various plugins and have the web applications to control the policy. And so this is similar to what FIDO is doing, but they use the, the client for the OTP credentials and doing the server and the client protocol. So my, my company is, is, a mem is a member of FIDO. Oath, um, we uh, went to work with them. And I did not know this, but you know, there's always politics involved in things, right? Well, FIDO was started by a couple of people that came from, well, they're at Knock Knock Labs. But they had come from a company that was bought by Symantec. PGP, and they left to start Knock Knock Labs, and I guess they didn't have a lot of love lost for Symantec, 
And Symantec is credited with being one of the founders of Oath. It was VeriSign at the time. So that's why the FIDO people did not want to work with Oath because they viewed Oath as being the Symantec uh, organization. Sometimes we find these things out later on in life. So just there's a little bit about the credential provisioning. We take the token manufacturer offline model and we take the standard uh, portable symmetric key container format. And then there's a dynamic real-time model where we have a, a dynamic symmetric key. Okay, so that's, that's a draft and also with OTA provisioning. And there's one more there. Uh, where did it go? Oh, there it is. The, the key prov working group. So that that's a uh, the current working group for for creating uh, RSE submissions. Okay. So basically, the objectives were to understand the full support needed for strong authentication, and to learn the different approaches to supporting strong authentication in our applications, and take the best practices. Right. So the certification program was to provide assurance to the customers that the products would be interoperable, right? And that's the key, so that you implemented the old standards properly and so that the customers could get best of breed solutions. And we got a couple of two draft certification profiles that were introduced at RSA and a, a number that are introduced throughout this year. So a typical scenario would be like a transaction authentication and signing, right? You're logging on to your website, to your bank, you give your username password, the bank sends a challenge to you to create a PIN, and then you enter that number onto your card or your token and secure a new passcode which will be generated. You then enter that back, submit to your bank. So it protects you against a man in the middle attack, right? Is that old, old news for everybody? Okay. So just a, a little bit about the framework, as you can see on this side, we have the end user with the, uh, the different types of IPsec, VPNs, and the web apps, and the servers, and then the validation protocol, whatever you're using, whether it's Radius or WS Security, whatnot. And then your, uh, your handler framework with your Radius, and then your validation framework all going into the on top of the infrastructure layer, right? So now I'm going to talk a little bit about why. Why is OTP still expensive, right? There are more than 50 companies. I heard there's somewhere like 100 some odd companies uh, that have one-time password solutions in various shapes, forms, and sizes, right? Soft tokens, hard tokens, event-based, time-based, challenge response-based. I view that it should be a, a commodity. A number of years ago, I was with a semiconductor company and I was responsible for the crypto chips. We had one competitor and we had brokers that turned us into a commodity because there were two of us making this product. Well, here there's this, this literally 50, 75 companies making these products and yet it's still not a commodity. So the model is these companies trying to make a lot of money. And that's great. I mean, I'm with a company that wants profits too, but I think if we want to spread the security out there, we need to do something. In the past, I would show a graph that would have three circles, or three bubbles on, and one would be cost, one would be security, and one would be convenience. And sometimes they intersect. And I would like to say that most often you can get two out of the three. You can get high security, High convenience, but it's going to come at a cost. If you're in a, a most American consumers, we want convenience. We don't give a damn about security, and we want low cost. If you're the government, you give up convenience because you want security. And of course, the cost is going to be high. So there's, you always have to balance those three parameters the way I see it. But I think with strong authentication, it's been around long enough that we should be able to get that cost down without sacrificing the security. So this company offers something called a Lin OTP. And the L originally stood for Linux. 
was a Linux-based product, which is open source, uh, but it uses the OAuth algorithm today, and it's, um, it's a flexible platform for strong authentication. It's available for free. All the OAuth tokens are supported. I'll show you a list in a minute. And it uses this smart virtual appliance. It's f excuse me, free to download, and the only cost is for support and maintenance. So the cost per user comes down from maybe whatever uh, a token cost is, 30 35 $40 to two. That's the difference. It's orders of magnitude less. So it works everywhere. The advantage is that they don't require a client-side driver. The accepted algorithms are, are open, right? Used for OTP integration, listed in the uh, H, uh, RFC 4226 for the HMAC OTP. And it supports other proprietary tokens and procedures. So sending the one-time passwords via maybe uh, uh, an M10 for a mobile uh, transaction number via SMS can also be done. Um, and the optional use of hardware tokens. So here is just a schematic of what it what it looks like. There's the core, the uh, the core of the Lin OTP with whatever you're using, you know, whether it's Radius or uh, whatever else you have connected there. And here's a list. This is a partial list of some of the supported tokens. You can see SafeNet, which is now Jamalto, uh, Fetian, Ubico, uh, Jamalto HID, Smart Display, Nagra, which is now Obether, Authentex, uh, BR Token, which has a new name, a Valid, LSE. So it, it supports anybody's token on the market. And that's, that's the important part. And it's free. So just a little bit about the authentication in integration architecture. So it's direct authentication integration over a standard protocol. And then there's a uh, plugin-based authentication. So this is some of the things that, that was the future that we've been working on. Enabling two-factor in your existing third-party authentication server. Okay, the codes don't need to change. The out-of-box strong authentication support for existing third-party servers, and uh, develops your customized plugin for for those authentication servers. And just a little bit more about the timeline. So here's some of the things that have been done: the OAuth reference architecture 2.0, risk-based authentication, and the IETF key prov, the key provisioning. And I'm not going to get into the risk-based authentication because I think it's too much. We don't have time for that. So I'm going to skip these here. And, uh, okay, just talk a little bit about technology beyond the password. So one of the things that's starting to come up, and uh, Gartner's been, been really big on this, is talking about adaptive authentication. So when you look at biometrics, we have fingerprint, iris, voice, face. Uh, there are some things where you can check your glucose, your, your, uh, your smell, your gait. There are so many ways we can monitor our biometric. But as I said, if they're not revocable, that's a concern, right? You can't revoke your fingerprints. So stronger passwords aren't really the answer, right? I mean, I have more than 25 passwords, right? Uh, you know, what we're trying to answer is an identification, right? Is it really you? For those that, that if anybody used Apple Pay, Apple Pay came out, they used the NFC chip, and there was a, you know, nice HSM, you know, inside the, the chip. It's really secure. Well, Visa had said that the first three, two, three months, they had a 6.5% fraud rate. Now, Visa's typical fraud rate on a credit card is somewhere around 0.1, 0 .1, and they were getting 6.5%. It's not that the chip was insecure. The Apple Pay is very secure. The chip is very secure. What the problem was is the front end. The people that were getting authenticated, the banks, in their rush to sign people up, lowered the bar, and they allowed anybody to get an Apple Pay. In other words, fraudsters with fake credit card numbers would call up Wells Fargo or Bank of America or Chase and say, I, I want an Apple Pay. Okay, what's your number? Here's my number. And they'd give them a, 
So they allowed them in the front door. Once you're in the front door, the system was really secure. So they've since closed that front door, made it a little bit challenging about checking the identification of the people ahead of time before they signed them up. So looking at, at this adaptive authentication, knowing what to type doesn't really authenticate us. All right, if I give you my password, you can type it in and you're in. But behavioral analytics can confirm that it's you. Eventually, we won't have to remember a password at all. Type a phrase, and then it's, it's going to know that it's really you. So looking at something called the behavioral advantage. Uh, hard for me to read that over there. Hopefully you can see that. But across the top, you can see the, uh, the types of things like that can't be uh, stolen or shared, identifies the person, and, and all the different benefits. And down the side, we have the different types of modalities, right? So behavioral has a lot of advantages beyond the password. And it's revocable, and there's no PII to be stolen. And so here's the key. The security technologies on, on rules fail to block the sophisticated attackers, right? The logs are generated and ignored because the, uh, the ability to act on them isn't there. The individuals are getting tricked, right? Are coerced into giving up their usernames and passwords. And the fraudsters are, are proficient, right? At assembling these full data records. So really, using behavior to securing our login is a is the latest, yeah, it's the latest focal point for the cyber attacks, right? And so with nothing to possess or lose or to remember or to fail, there's a real benefit. So we talked about the, the breaches and that was two years ago. So I see when I talk about behavioral biometrics, what I mean are things such as how we swipe our phone, how we type, and the analytics of all that, there's something along with this that's considered uh, continuous authentication. So as you're working, you constantly, if you're in a, say, in a uh, education mode, testing mode, checked, you're, you're being monitored as to how you're being typed, how you're typing, so that they know that it's continuously you so that you didn't log in and then hand your PC over to somebody else and let them complete your test or something for you. So there are all these techniques that are coming out to protect companies and the individual at the same time. Pardon? How this can be changed, right? How this is stolen, can be stolen? Well, it's really hard to steal because it's how you type. So. I can't type like you. Even if I tried, I can narrow the parameters such that no one would get near. You can make it so tight that even you could have a hard time reproducing it. You don't want to make it that tight, but you can. You can vary it so much. And you can make it where it's not one word. It's you type a whole paragraph, and they use how you typed in, the, the H's, the T's, how much you paused, the angularity of that. It's a multi-dimensional space that's created. That's what, what they do. If I break my pen? You're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I was experimenting with all these products on one of my secondary laptops. I sprained my right hand. Mm -hmm. I lost my ability to log in. And unless I simulated the not hurt angle of my, of my right hand, right. everything I do makes me log in again and again. So all through the day, I'm like screaming, ow, my life, what's wrong? I'm like, just log in. <laughs> Yeah, in, in, those circum, in those circumstances, there are fail-safe, you know, there are fallback mechanisms where you can log in and, you know, request, you know, a, a temporary password, and they would come back to you with an email telling you something. So, it, you know, there are ways to, that you can get it in a temporary basis. Like, but if you cut your finger off, you may have to re-enroll, right? It's it's like with a fingerprint. If you lose, you know, if you lose your fingers, you you can't re-enroll because you don't have your fingers left. It's 
it's a technique that we're going to see more of because uh, we're just the overall biometrics is growing tremendously. Uh, Ten years ago, you know, if you were to ask Americans, would you be okay with having an iris scan as, as a validation of who you are? And the people said, no, it was too invasive. Well, I was at CES a couple weeks ago, and I was talking to Diebold, the largest ATM manufacturer. And guess what they're rolling out? Iris scan at their ATMs. And I asked that question, and they said, we're doing it with, I think, Citibank. We have trials going on in New York, and I think some in L.A. And our focus groups, the people love it. And I said, that's interesting. That's a huge shift in, in the population attitudes in 10 years. You know, so I think as, as we get more and more uh, accustomed to needing security, we're willing to do things that we weren't years ago. Many years ago, I uh, worked for a company that made a biometric sensor. And after 9-11, the company said, oh, it's going to be in every airport. Every access door in every airport in the United States. Well, they were a semiconductor company. And so I had a market lady come up with, there were 70,000 airport doors, 70,000 access points in all the airports in America. So for a semiconductor company, 70,000 chips is about a week's worth of work. It's, it's, it's like one batch or two batches. It's not worth it to being in that business. But today, and this shows how wrong prognosticators can be. What are we, 14 years later, I use biometric every day, a fingerprint sensor, when I go to my gym. It's not very secure, but everybody said, oh, it's going to be in all these high secure places. No. They were have biometric sensors on guns. They've developed it. They canned it. They got rid of it because it wasn't, wasn't effective. I mean, if I have a gun and I'm trying to use it, I don't want to be fumbling to try and get my, my sensor to, to read my finger. If anybody's used a fingerprint sensor on your PC, how many have used one on your PC? Does it work first time every time? Uh, no. <laughs> no. If you didn't enroll properly, I had a swipe sensor on, on an older PC and I enrolled in a, a little bit of a funny way. I had to, just like the man was saying, I had to redo that funny way every time I tried to log on. And it was so frustrating, I, I got out of it and just used the password. So what I'm saying is we're, we're changing our attitudes towards different things. I don't know if that's good or bad, but we are changing. So really, what we're trying to do is drive a fundamental shift from proprietary to open solutions. Not only what Oath is doing, but what my company is doing is to make it open, to make it low cost, so that we can have strong authentication everywhere. So the Oath reference architecture, I said, is based on open standards, and it's available to foster innovation and lower cost. And just some things if you wanted to find out more. There's some, there's, the website's not, not listed there, but here's some, uh, some other uh, open source implementations. And here are the references and the resources. And I think with that, I'm done. Any questions? Yes? So I feel like on that uh, behavioral advantage chart, mm. you should have a column that says, like, creepy factor. Ah. Because, mm -hmm. like, when you talk about the behavioral analysis, like, for me, just as a data point of one, like, to me, that's hugely creepy. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the notion that it's constantly monitoring to determine my patterns and, and sort of determine whether it's me or not. Like, it, it's one thing if I trust my operating system or I trust whoever is, you know, recording and storing this data. Just storing the device, I probably feel better than about it being stored somewhere else. But I, I just kind of wonder what your thoughts are on, you know, the degree to which, you know, again, this may be a subset of people find this creepy, number one. And I'm also curious as to how it's revocable. I mean, if something knows my behavioral patterns, I can't easily, you know, change those patterns. So how is it revocable? Because you can't change those patterns. But they're going to record and replay them. Yeah. No. It sounds irrevocable. It is. No, it's revocable because you can take your patterns and then all of a sudden you can say, 
we don't want him to have access anymore, and you can cut that off, right? So isn't but it kind of like the fingerprint with, with Merkel, she puts her hand up, right? Now everyone has that. Right. As soon as someone has my behavioral patterns, and that di- and that information gets breached, now every and whole planet. No, they can't reproduce it. They can't just take it and can it and replay it. It's it, it's not open to a, a replay attack. It has because what if you tried to use it, the bank is going to send say, tell me the cow jumped over the moon, and so you have to type in the cow jumped over the moon. So you won't be able to reproduce that. Quick follow up. Yeah. So if if a um, if this information, however, were to be in the hands of marketers, then they now know who I am, no matter what, all the time. So they can track my whole behavior, target ads. If sure. Need. So that that's a valid point. The continuous authentication and the biometric authentication from analytic, you know, analytical. But there's two separate issues two separate items so you can you can use behavioral biometrics to log in the continuous authentication is is something beyond that okay just having a, a you know a login doesn't mean they're going to be doing continuous i don't i find the continuous authentication other than an e-learning environment to be incredibly intrusive and I don't think there's, I, the only thing the applications for it is more like e-learning when you're doing them with test center or, you know, if, if I hate to say it, but if you're in a, in a, um, uh, a sales mode where people are supposed to be making so many phone calls or, or, or contacting so many people per day or per hour so you can monitor that effectively because they do that today, you know, but this is a, a better way for them to do that. I'm not saying it's good, you know. Sure. It's, it's a knife, right, and it can be used, yeah. <laughs> Good or bad. Any other questions? No? Super. Great. Well, thanks. I guess this was the last one, right?